Hello and welcome to another episode of Reviews Redux, where I take another look at one of my older reviews and bring it up to my more current quality standards. Today I'm taking a look at Gabriel Knight's Sins of the Fathers, the first game in the Gabriel Knight trilogy, along with its remake, Gabriel Knight Sins of the Fathers 20th Anniversary Edition, both of which were released for PC and Mac. What you're seeing here is of course the PC version, and the way this will ultimately work is that I will spend almost the entire video talking about the original version, and then I will have a section at the end talking about the remake. Both of these are point-and-click adventure games, although the original was developed and published by Sierra Online back in 1993 as both a floppy disk and a CD release. Although you never hear anybody talking about the floppy disk release, mostly because it was straight up inferior to the CD version. The CD version had voice acting as well as additional cutscenes, and it was also the version that got re-released multiple times over the years. And of course, the currently available digital releases are all the CD version as well. So, the floppy disk version has more or less become a historical curiosity at this point. And while the game was a very big critical success upon its original release, it wasn't all that much of a commercial success. It did well enough to where Sierra decided to do two additional games, those being The Beast Within a Gabriel Knight Mystery and Gabriel Knight 3 Blood of the Sacred, Blood of the Damned, both of which, oddly enough, ended up in similar situations where they were very well received critically, but weren't very successful commercially. And unfortunately, by the time the third game released in 1999, the market for adventure games really wasn't there anymore. Other genres had stolen the limelight, and so adventure games struggled for relevance, and over the ensuing decade, the genre more or less died out. Sure, you'd have a few successes here and there, like The Longest Journey or the Siberia series, but for the most part, adventure games throughout the 2000s were seen as a liability, and they were just not made. So even though the third game leaves things open for a sequel, there ended up never being a Gabriel Knight 4. And that continues to this day, even though the 20th Anniversary Edition did get made by Jane Jensen's studio Pinkerton Road, there really haven't been any developments about the series since then. The 20th Anniversary Edition remake wasn't a very big success, and so Pinkerton Road hasn't been able to secure any funding for any projects. In fact, I'm not even sure they exist anymore. Their website certainly doesn't. But I can't seem to find any information about the studio officially closing down. And with Activision owning the rights to the series at this point and having less than no interest in literally anything that is not Call of Duty, and Jane Jensen herself seemingly having no interest in returning to video games, instead deciding to write basically nothing but gay romance fiction since 2013, most Gabriel Knight fans have more or less accepted that we're never actually going to see a Gabriel Knight 4, and thus never actually see a proper conclusion to the series. Which, given the series' legacy, is a real shame. But for me, it's something a bit worse than that. Because Gabriel Knight's Sins of the Fathers is my favorite adventure game of all time. And those of you who are a bit newer to my channel may not necessarily understand what that means, because the majority of videos I put out are on first-person shooters and role-playing games, as well as, of course, strategy games and action-adventure games, although I don't do those quite as often. But I don't make videos on adventure games all that often, and when I do, they usually don't get all that many views, which doesn't really surprise me given how many people tune in to my first-person shooter and RPG videos in particular, and tend to ignore a lot of the other stuff I do. But if you're only watching my videos on first-person shooters and RPGs, or especially if you're only watching one or the other, then you're not gonna understand that adventure games are one of my primary three genres. Now, unfortunately, I don't play adventure games all that often anymore because I really have to be in the right mood for them, and I also have to have a good amount of uninterrupted time to be able to immerse myself in them. But on average, I'll enjoy a good adventure game far more than I'll enjoy a good first-person shooter or even an RPG. So if I were to sit down and actually organize a list of my top games of all time, Gabriel Knight's Sins of the Fathers would be in the very least in the top five, probably even in the top three. Obviously, this means I am biased in favor of this game, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to criticize it, because it is nowhere near perfect. But to be fair, there's no such thing as a perfect game. So with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and actually start delving into this thing and find out what exactly we're dealing with here, and how well it holds up nearly 30 years later. And like always, we'll go ahead and start with the presentation, which in the original game's case is entirely composed of pixel art, and very good pixel art for the era. 
Which isn't exactly surprising given that Sierra and LucasArts were basically in a constant back and forth between the two on who could one-up the other in terms of adventure game tech, and even though they went for something a bit more realistic in the art style here than what LucasArts was doing, for example, it actually still holds up extremely well to this day. They packed quite a lot of detail into the pixel art, and even if you do upscale it to 1080p and adjust for the 16x9 aspect ratio like you see in this video, you're still getting a game that looked great in its genre at the time it released, and it still looks good to this day because it is aged rather gracefully, as a lot of those old school retro pixel art games did. There are certainly some quirks here and there that are worth mentioning. For example, some of the animations are a bit simplistic, and sometimes their reach exceeded their grasp a bit with regards to some of the visual details they were trying to pack into things, and you end up with something that's a bit too pixelated to really tell exactly what it's going for, but you can still muddle through all of that without much difficulty. And because everything is detailed enough, and the interactable objects stand out from the environment a bit more, you don't really run into situations where you have to do a whole lot of pixel hunting, where there's just that one pixel that you're missing and you have no idea where it is. That, combined with the very clean and intuitive interface, makes it a very easy game to just pick up and control without any real difficulty. And given that some people would describe this as a horror game, but it's really more of a supernatural thriller, the strong visuals go quite a way in enhancing the game's atmosphere. An atmosphere which is unfortunately let down a bit by the sound design. Now, that's not to say that the sound design is bad, because for its time, it's very good. It's just that certain aspects of it really haven't aged all that well. The elephant in the room is of course going to be the actual sound quality, which is pretty low. It was good for its time, but there's a lot of pops and crackles, and the sound mixing itself is fairly messy in a lot of spots, leading to a bit of an inconsistent experience. Which is a real shame, because they have one hell of a voice cast in this game. And while their performances are certainly let down by the rough mixing and the rough audio quality, you're still getting Tim Curry as Gabriel Knight doing a pretty goofy New Orleans accent that frankly has a whole lot of charm in it, as well as Mark Hamill as his detective friend Mosley, Leah Remini as Gabriel's co-worker Grace Nakamura, and Michael Dorn as the voodoo historian Dr. John. Not to mention Ephraim Zembalus Jr. as Wolfgang Ritter and Willie Walker being voiced by Rocky Carroll. Even the casting for the narrator is really good. They chose Virginia Capers for the role and she just knocks it out of the park in this thing. And while the rest of the actors aren't quite as well known, they also do a fantastic job. In fact, it's surprising that the voice acting in this game is as good as it is when you keep in mind that this game released in 1993 and voice acting in video games was a very new thing. Despite some of the lines being a bit cheesy and the audio quality getting in the way of things, there is a surprising amount of character depth and emotion conveyed through the voice acting in this thing, and it just has this sort of inimitable charm about it, where it pretty carefully skirts the line between being too serious and not serious enough. So even though some of the accents are a bit cheesy and some of the lines themselves are a bit cheesy, they're delivered well enough to where you can still take them seriously when something serious serious is happening. But then when something a bit more lighthearted is happening, it still works. It also helps that there's a good amount of snappy banter in the game, and the characters are fleshed out enough to where you can actually believe they are proper characters, as opposed to just being one-dimensional cardboard cutouts. And while that tends to speak a lot to the qualities of the writing in the game, it speaks also to just how good the voice cast is at delivering that writing. But once you move past the voice acting, which at the time was certainly very front and center, and remains so to this day, the music is also very well done. It was composed by Robert Holmes, and some of those tracks have remained in my skull for almost 30 friggin' years at this point. Throughout the game, the music is used to accentuate the things that are going on, and thus you end up with a soundtrack that is as atmospheric as it is catchy. In fact, if there's really anything I can complain about when it comes to the audio, it's just the actual audio quality and the mixing, 
and the fact that the sound effects just get the job done. There's nothing particularly impressive about those. But as for the voice acting and the music, well, sure, the music holds up a lot better than the voice acting does because the music is all in MIDI tracks and isn't really subject to audio quality issues. But once you get past the audio quality issues, the voice acting still holds up really well too. And when you bring all of the presentation together, you end up with a game that has aged pretty gracefully for the most part. It was fantastic to look at and listen to back in its day, and while the audio quality in particular has suffered over the years as audio quality has improved in games dramatically, that issue really doesn't detract from the experience as much as you might think it would. But of course, what really matter here are the story and the gameplay, and I'm going to go ahead and talk about the gameplay first because there's a lot less to talk about in that regard. This is a point-and-click adventure game in the traditional Sierra style, which is to say that you have a graphical interface that will give you various actions you can perform. You will select that and then you will go to something in the environment and then click on that in order to perform the action you selected on it. You can also right-click the mouse to cycle through all of the various actions, and you also have an inventory slot where you can select an item from your inventory, and then you can click on that or scroll to it using the right mouse button, and then click on something in the environment to try to use that item on whatever it is you're clicking on in the environment. And most of the gameplay consists of solving various puzzles. This can be done either by simply interacting with things in the environment in certain ways, or by finding various inventory items and then using those on different things in the environment, or sometimes even combining things in your inventory and then using them in the environment. And unlike a lot of Sierra Adventure games at the time, most of the puzzles in this are actually pretty straightforward and make a lot of sense. You're certainly not going to run into the kind of ridiculous nonsense that you would see in the likes of, say, King's Quest V with the infamous pie puzzle. That's not necessarily to say that the puzzles are easy, however. If you're paying a lot of attention to the various things that you're running into throughout the game, if you're exploring a fair bit, reading all the documents you're finding, and that sort of thing, then you're probably not going to have too much trouble with the puzzles. There are a few puzzles that are timed, but it's pretty obvious when they're timed, so you're not really going to worry too much about those either, and as long as you're following the mantra of save early, save often, which is something you should be doing in basically every adventure game anyway, then you'll find most of the game is pretty smooth sailing. The game is split into 10 days, and at the beginning of each day it will give you a few lines of verse that will give you a hint about things that are about to happen during that day, and even though a day will only end once you've completed all of the major story elements for that particular day, there are actually a few things you can complete technically out of sequence, and by that I mean they are available from the beginning, and there may even be the clues you need to be able to solve that puzzle early on, but there's just certain plot elements that are revealed later on down the line that give you the context that will bring all of that together. The same kind of thing goes for certain locations, where they're available early on in the game, but you can't really do anything there until later on. It's just there for you to explore and get familiar with, so that when you get further into the game and you get to that point where there is a puzzle in that location, you'll have an understanding of what that area is and what you have to work with. And unlike a lot of Sierra games from back in the day, it's pretty difficult to softlock yourself, because there's only really two points in the game where you can do that, and they're not only at the end of the game anyway, but it's pretty painfully obvious what you have to do in order to softlock yourself, so you're probably not going to do it. This ultimately makes Gabriel Knight Sins of the Fathers a much more forgiving adventure game than most of the other Sierra adventure games of the era, thus making it a lot more palatable to the kind of people who really can't put up with the ability to softlock yourself in a particular game. And while I certainly understand that in a lot of the old Sierra Adventure games case, where it would be because you missed some obscure item early on in the game or something like that, the softlocks really aren't a fault of Gabriel Knight's Sins of the Fathers, precisely because they're really the player's fault, not the fault of the game. So from a gameplay mechanics perspective, there's actually not very much to complain about in this thing, and it ends up being a very solid adventure game for its era, one that is pretty easy to pick up and play even to this day. It certainly doesn't hold your hand, but it also doesn't throw you to the wolves either. It gives you all the context you need to be able to solve puzzles, 
and the puzzles in this game are generally grounded enough to where you don't really need to worry too much about the where do I go, what do I do syndrome that tended to plague a lot of the old school Sierra adventure games or just adventure games in general, that kind of moon logic that was infamous for the time. But what about the story, because that's really what's going to make or break this thing for you. Well, the story takes place in New Orleans in June of 1993 over the course of 10 days, and you take on the role of Gabriel Knight, a novelist who also runs St. George's Bookshop, along with his employee Grace Nakamura. Gabriel's writing a horror novel based on the so-called voodoo murders, a series of gruesome murders that have been taking place in the city as of late, and which have been baffling the authorities. Gabriel himself has been suffering from nightmares as of late, which have been strikingly vivid and very consistent, which has definitely set him on edge. As Gabriel starts to investigate the voodoo murders looking for material for his book, he starts to realize that even though the authorities are saying that the voodoo angle is faked, that may not necessarily be true. And so a lot of the game is spent investigating voodoo and learning more about the religion and its roots and how those influence the voodoo trappings found at the various crime scenes. And along the way, Gabriel ends up running into a socialite named Molly Hagetti, who he more or less falls in love with instantly, and thus you're also trying to pursue some sort of romance with her. And there's also the matter of Gabriel's nightmares, which intensify over the course of the game and get more vivid and expand their scope as time goes on, and how that relates to his family legacy, because as it turns out, both his father and grandfather were all also plagued by nightmares. Now, it is worth noting that this is a mystery story, and as such, I want to avoid spoiling it as much as I can, but suffice to say, as you continue to find more clues and explore the various plot threads, you start to realize how a lot of things are much more connected than they initially seem, and by the end of the game, you have a very good understanding of all of those various plot threads and how they all relate to one another, if they relate to one another at all, and you understand the greater mysteries. And it all builds towards a rather intense conclusion where you'll get one of two different endings depending on a choice you make at the very end, although only one of those endings is considered canon and would be carried over into the beast within a Gabriel Knight mystery and, of course, Gabriel Knight 3, Blood of the Sacred, Blood of the Damned. And while the story does take a bit to really get going, it stays interesting throughout its entirety because everything is working towards that conclusion and there's always new aspects of the mystery to uncover, at least until you get to the very end. And that's all helped along by the rather snappy dialogue and the pretty strong character writing, where the characters actually do feel fleshed out. They're not just one-dimensional cardboard cutouts like you would see in pretty much every game even to this day. They have strengths, they have flaws, and they react to things in a manner that actually comes across as pretty believable rather than just, oh look, I'm a video game character doing video game character things. And while there are certainly a few exposition dumps in the dialogue here and there, more often than not, that's because you are directly asking people to give you exposition dumps. So, for example, you'll go to Dr. John and start asking him about voodoo, and he will give you exposition dumps about the history of voodoo, because that's why you went to talk to him in the first place. Whereas if you're talking to, for example, Grace, you can ask her for a lot of information about herself and what she thinks about the city and all that sort of thing, and some of the ensuing banter between her and Gabriel can be rather amusing, but you don't really need to talk to her about those things. You can just keep it simple and just ask her for your messages and ask her to conduct research for you and only ask her about things that come up during your investigations. And really, the only character I would describe as having pretty unnatural and stilted dialogue is the professor, although to be fair, I have run into people throughout my time on this miserable planet that actually do act the way he does. So even though those conversations do end up being stilted and awkward, it's still actually pretty believable. And between the rather snappy and believable dialogue, which has quite a bit of rather good banter in it and the rather interesting plot, you end up with a story that is pretty riveting throughout the entirety of it. 
It's actually pretty easy to get attached to the characters, and as such, when shit starts to hit the fan, you actually do start to worry for their well-being, and that does create some pretty good tension when it happens. The end result, when you combine the story, the characters, and the gameplay, is a rather strong supernatural thriller that will definitely keep you very interested throughout, and which has ultimately become one of the best adventure games ever made. It did, however, get generally overshadowed by its two sequels, especially The Beast Within A Gabriel Knight Mystery, which is generally considered a better game, although, again, the original is still my favorite in the series, and thus my favorite adventure game of all time. It's got a strong story and characters, with rather strong voice acting for its era, which holds up surprisingly well to this day. And even the gameplay holds up rather well, both from the fact that just the general mechanics themselves are well implemented, the puzzles themselves are well implemented, and it also includes things like the tape recorder, where you can go back and listen to the conversations that you've had, just in case you need to refresh your memory or you think you might have missed something. The puzzles themselves have a distinct lack of moon logic, which certainly helps their case, and it also helps that they are well woven into the actual plot. They make sense when they come up. And with this game being as easy to pick up and play as it is, there's absolutely no reason for me not to recommend Gabriel Knight's Sins of the Fathers. The issues it does have are mostly just technical limitations from the era, things like the audio quality or some of the mixing being off, and some of the animations and sounds not necessarily syncing as well as you might hope. And the issues that aren't on the technical side are really not that big of a deal. Things like the occasional sour line of dialogue here or there, or the just occasionally cheesy moment here or there, which actually just ends up giving the game a bit of charm instead of really being much of an issue. You don't even run into a common issue for adventure games of that era, which was the where do I go and what do I do effect. That is one of the most common issues you will run into with basically any adventure game, but Gabriel Knight doesn't really have that problem because it always nudges you in the right direction. You may not necessarily know what you have to do to get there, but you can figure it out along the way because it gives you just enough to point you in the right direction without stepping over the line and just holding your hand. And while you could very easily make an argument for especially The Beast Within, but even Gabriel Knight 3 being objectively better games, that doesn't mean that Sins of the Fathers is a bad game or isn't worth your time. It is well worth playing for anybody who's a fan of adventure games, and if you're looking to get into the genre and are willing to put up with some of the game's rougher edges, it's also a rather good starting point for getting into the genre in the first place. And with the price of entry being as low as it is, six bucks on GOG for example, I can easily say that if you are an adventure game fan and you haven't already picked up Gabriel Knight, then you definitely need to, and if you're looking to get into the genre, then this is a very good place to start. But then you might be asking yourself, well, which version do I try if I'm going to be going into this game? Do I play the original version of the game, or do I play the 20th Anniversary Edition remake? Well, I've played both, so let me go ahead and give you the rundown on what 20th Anniversary Edition does. It is a full-on remake as opposed to just an HD remaster. The first thing you'll notice is that they redid all the visuals. Instead of it being 2D pixel art, it is now 3D character models and animations with some 3D objects that those characters will interact with, but the rest of it all being 2D backgrounds. They also redid the existing cutscenes to have a bit smoother animation and of course be much higher resolution. They also put in some new cutscenes and a couple of extra areas that weren't in the original game, and did some retooling to the story and some of the puzzles so that they are organized in a different manner. The 20th Anniversary Edition is a considerably more linear version than the original, where the original had some locations where you could go to them early and explore them and maybe even solve some puzzles early, and the 20th Anniversary Edition has a very rigid order in which you need to do things. And the changes to some of the puzzles really don't help the game in any appreciable manner. If anything, they actually hurt it. 
because they add extra hoops for you to jump through without any real benefit, and some of the extra things they add into the 20th Anniversary Edition also require you to think more along the lines of the moon logic that was infamous among adventure games back when the original game released. So you end up with puzzles that really feel like they were put into the game to have extra puzzles and not because they actually benefit the game or its story, especially in any real appreciable manner. To give you a prime example, there's one puzzle that involves needing to get money in the original game, and in the original game it called for $100. You got that $100 by performing one action. And then in the 20th Anniversary Edition, you not only have to do exactly what you did in the original game, but you also have to drum up an extra $20, which you have basically no idea where to get. In fact, you'll only figure it out by wandering around and just looking at basically every random thing you can find, until eventually you find a vase that's been placed at your family's tomb and you have no idea why. And then a squirrel just comes out of nowhere and knocks the vase over, thus shattering it and revealing that it had 20 bucks in it. Now sure, that's a spoiler, but honestly, I don't care because it's one of the dumber things you'll run into in the 20th Anniversary Edition, and it is completely superfluous. There was no reason to add that to the game. The original puzzle was fine as is. They didn't need to add an extra hoop for you to jump through on top of it. But the one change which actually will probably make or break this thing for you is actually the change to the voice cast. For whatever reason, they couldn't just remaster the audio from the original game and had to re-record everything with a new cast, which also includes some changes to some of the dialogue which make it less snappy and less interesting. And the new voice cast is a very mixed bag. Some of the voices are okay, but others are pretty awful, like the new voice for Gabriel. And you end up with voice acting that actually ends up detracting from the experience rather than enhancing it like it did with the original voice cast in the original version of the game. Mm-hmm. I told you it's that voodoo book you're researching. That stuff can seriously screw up karma. I'm sure that's it. Maybe I should write a horror novel on passive resistance instead. Seventh damn night in a row. I told you, it's that voodoo book you're researching. That stuff can seriously screw with your karma. Unfortunately, I don't think my readers would go for a horror novel about fluffy bunny rabbits. The simple fact of the matter is that 20th Anniversary Edition would have been better served as simply an HD remaster rather than a full-on remake. Because they actually changed things about the gameplay and the way the story progresses, and especially the voice cast as well, it actually ends up being a noticeably worse experience than simply playing through the original game again, and all going through the 20th Anniversary Edition did was make me want to play the original. Which is why you're getting a redux of Gabriel Knight along with this MTO of the 20th Anniversary Edition, because I originally planned on this video simply being an MTO on the 20th Anniversary Edition, and throughout the entire time I was messing with it, I was just like, man, I just really want to play the original game instead of playing this remake. And so eventually I said, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to play through the original game again and do a redux of that and throw this MTO about the 20th Anniversary Edition at the end of it, because there's really not a whole lot to say about 20th Anniversary Edition. It's just flat out inferior to the original game, even though it does run in modern resolutions and is more smooth in terms of frame rate, and it has a slightly simplified interface that is a bit easier to pick up and use than the original game's interface. But the changes made to the story and the puzzles were completely unnecessary, and the changes to the dialogue just leave the dialogue feeling less snappy and less interesting than the original. And when you factor in the noticeably weaker voice cast, you end up with something that just doesn't have the same kind of charm that the original game has. And as such, the only truly positive thing about the 20th Anniversary Edition is the reorchestrated soundtrack, which... Honestly, you're better off just getting the soundtrack on its own and just listening to it and enjoying it that way. Because as good as the reorchestrated soundtrack is, it's not worth playing through the entirety of the 20th Anniversary Edition to experience it. 
So while I can wholeheartedly recommend the original Gabriel Knight Sins of the Fathers, at least the CD version, which is the version that is most readily available anyway, I really can't recommend the 20th Anniversary Edition at all, even if you are a fan of the series. And it's really not surprising to see that the 20th Anniversary Edition didn't seem to do very well. Its changes were ultimately a net negative to the experience, and people would just rather play the original, which is exactly what happened to me when I was going through the 20th Anniversary Edition. The more I played it, the more I was just remarking to myself, man, they didn't really do a very good job with this. I'd rather just play the original game. So I did, and it was one hell of a good time. If you're interested in getting a copy of Gabriel Knight's Sins of the Fathers for yourself, I'll have links in the video description box to where you can pick up the game on either GOG or Steam. And while I'll certainly still have links to the 20th Anniversary Edition down there as well, I would very highly recommend against picking up the 20th Anniversary Edition. Just stick with the original. It's a great game, it still holds up, and even though it's certainly not perfect, and it's not even really the best adventure game ever made from anything remotely resembling an objective standpoint, it's still my personal favorite adventure game of all time. So take that for what it's worth. Thanks for watching. If you like the kind of videos I make, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. All of the revenue from that goes directly back into the channel, whether it be getting more games for review, or replacing broken equipment, or getting new equipment, or whatever the case may be. If you can't afford to or don't want to, that is perfectly fine. I understand. But the option's there if you're interested. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you all in later videos.